everyone. I'm Barbara Rush, past chair of Holocaust Education Week. It's wonderful to see so many of you here at this, the final program of Holocaust Education Week 2007. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our co-chairs, Stephen Alban and Leslie Schwartz, for organizing 11 days of thought-provoking and inspiring programs. I'm sure we'd all agree that it's been an exceptional event. I'd also like to thank that Setic congregation for its ongoing commitment to this extraordinary annual event. Rabbi Friedman Cole, Rabbi Tannenbaum, and Cantor Spiro for their participation, and Marlene Laba for her energetic assistance in making this evening possible. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of tonight's program. Martin Maxwell, in memory of his two sisters, Josephine and Erna Mizells, who died in the Holocaust. Martin wears a number of hats as survivor speaker at the Holocaust Center. In fact, he spoke from this BIMA at a program a couple of years ago, as well as a veteran. Scotiabank, Bathurst Shepherd, and Bathurst Lawrence branches. We're particularly pleased that our corporate neighbors recognize the importance of Holocaust remembrance and are working to further the ideals of tolerance in our community. Nicholas M. and Hetty Monk for their generosity in supporting an annual lecture at the synagogue, and the late William Brody, who thanks to his endowment to the Pearl Gertrude Brody Memorial Lecture in memory of his beloved sister, programs like this take place. I'm very pleased to be introducing our guest speaker this evening. We've welcomed Dr. Berenbaum to Holocaust Education Week on previous occasions, and his talks have always been profoundly moving and informative. It was in part as a result of a lecture he gave in Toronto some years ago that I became committed to Holocaust education myself. Indeed, he is regarded as one of the foremost authorities on the subject in the world. It would be impossible to do justice to his many accomplishments in the field of Holocaust scholarship in a short introduction, as it would seriously impinge upon his address. So I will limit myself to just a few highlights of his career. Michael Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher consulting in the conceptual development of museums and historical films. He is director of the Siggy Zering Institute, exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust, and an adjunct professor of theology at the University of Judaism. Dr. Berenbaum is the executive editor of the New Encyclopedia Judaica, a second edition of the monumental 1972 work that now consists of 16 million words in 22 volumes. For three years, he was president and chief officer of the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation and served as the director of the United States Holocaust Research Institute at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, where from 1988 to 93, he served as project director, overseeing its creation. He is the author of 16 books and hundreds of scholarly articles and journalistic pieces. The World Must Know is now considered a seminal work, and a more recent offering, After the Passion Has Passed, American Religious Consequences, was occasioned by the controversy that swirled around Mel Gibson's film, The Passion. In film, his work as co-producer of One Survivor Remembers, the Gerda Weissman Klein story, garnered an Academy Award an Emmy, and the Cable Ace Award. And he was the historical consultant on the Shoah Foundation's documentary, The Last Days, which won an Academy Award for the best feature-length documentary of 1998. He has also served as historical consultant for a number of award-winning television films and documentaries. Professor Berenbaum has taught at several American universities, including Wesleyan and, and Yale. Among his students was famed entertainer Burl, 
Pearl Bailey, who wrote of him, the wisdom I gained from his class is priceless. He is aggressive, tough, wise as some sages of yore, and as brilliant as a diamond. When class ended, you felt filled, drained, and filled again. But none of these credentials and statistics can truly convey Michael Berenbaum's profound understanding of the Holocaust or the compelling nature of his talks. I'm confident that when we leave here tonight, we will be not only informed, but quite possibly transformed. Please welcome Dr. Michael Berenbaum. And my task at that point was to tell um, one of the most truly marvelous stories of the Holocaust, which was the Danish rescue. And we were commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Danish rescue, and I had just returned from Denmark. And uh, now it's my task to conclude Holocaust Remembrance Week. And what I'd like to share with you tonight a little bit is what do we know? What don't we know? What do we still have to know? And what are we likely to know? Now let me begin by saying that when we say what do we know and what don't we know, we're not dealing with the world of Holocaust denial. The world of Holocaust denial is a world you, in one sense, cannot deal with because the question is, in the aftermath of, for example, having gone to the moon and seen the rotation of the Earth and the nature of the Earth from outer space, how can you argue with the Flat Earth Society? And the Holocaust is one of the most documented crimes in human history. The perpetrators left meticulous records. I'm going to talk to you this evening about a hundred million documents that have recently become available to the general public. A hundred million documents created by the perpetrators. The victims being who they are documented extensively and extraordinarily what they were going through. And no generation has left a greater post-event record than the record of Holocaust survivors. And we've all been privileged in the most extraordinary way imaginable to live at a time when video technology is available. And therefore, the extensive documentation that we're going to have, inexpensive video technology is available. And the extensive documentation we're going to have is not from a small group of people who write memoirs and books, but from everyone from a Harvard professor to Joe the Baker, from Rachel to um, a judge, all of whom have told you the story of the events that they lived through. Let me give, begin with one more preface about Holocaust denial, which is just to describe the madness of our world. I presume that we all live on the planet Earth and therefore we all have known about the events of the president of Iran. But I don't know how many of you know what the historical record of Iran was during the Shoah. The reality is that during the Shoah, no Jew had their fingernail injured or their shoelaces taken. And that Jews lived safely and securely in Iran during the Holocaust. And in fact, Iran became the means by which Jews escaped. And there is a group of children called the Children of Tehran who found safety because of the role that Iran played as a haven rescue. So if you want evidence that the world is crazy, you have to ask yourself the question, tell me something, who should deny the Holocaust? Should a country which had provoked the murder of six million Jews and executed a policy, should the president of that country deny the Holocaust or should the president of a country 
in which not a fingernail of a Jew was injured, in which Jews lived safely and securely during the entire time of turmoil. If anybody should deny the Holocaust, it's the president of Germany. And if anybody should affirm the Holocaust and say, look at what you miserable people in the West did, it should be the president of Iran and only the madness of our age. The real madness of our age has the president of Iran denying the Holocaust and the president of Germany saying, oh yes, we know the Holocaust took place, we did it. And the only way that we are going to be able to face our future and build our future is by admitting that we did it and somehow beginning to make amends. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But the craziness of our world is that the denier is the one whose country rescued and the person who admits it is the country of the perpetrator. And that has to be an irony that is deeply and profoundly disturbing. Let me begin now by saying one other thing about knowing an event. Elie Wiesel once said that only those who were there will ever know, and those who were there can never tell. Now, in order to accept what Wiesel said, for those of us who are not survivors, we would have to say we can't know. The event is inaccessible to us. Now, it could be at the end of great research, the event remains inaccessible and there is something we do not know and cannot know. But that can only be at the end of attempting to know, not at the beginning. So those of us who are not survivors have to believe that somehow with the tools available to us, with the learning available to us, with the material available to us, we can know. And if the end, something of it eludes us, then that's the humility that is necessary to continue the process by which we learn. We cannot believe at the beginning that we can't know, but we cannot presume to have the arrogance to think that everything can be known. A word about what we have to know, and here I want to point out the brilliant work of my colleague in California, an Israeli professor by the name of Professor Shaul Friedlander, who wrote a two-volume series, the last volume of which came out called The Years of Ex Extermination. And what he did in this two-volume series was to try a very interesting methodology. Just a word about Shaul Friedlander himself. Shaul Friedlander was himself the child of Holocaust victims who himself had found safety in France and was studying for the priesthood when somebody approached him and said, do you know that your parents died in Auschwitz? He went from the edge of becoming a priest to becoming an Israeli and then becoming a scholar. And his first initial scholarly work was on the Vatican and the role of the Roman Catholic Church, a faith in which he was raised by his adopted family and a faith where it took him a very long time to move from and to rejoin the Jewish people. What was Friedlander's great achievement as a scholar? He began to say that there really are four different histories to the Holocaust, and most historians have focused on one or another of the histories, but never all of them combined. There's the history of the perpetrator. How was the crime done? How was it committed? What is the step-by-step -step way in which the perpetrators perpetrated their crime? What was the step-by-step -step in which Germany was transformed from a difficult democracy into a totalitarian state? 
from which Jews who had been an integrated part of Germany all of a sudden were separated. Essentially segregation, apartheid were introduced, discrimination became the policy of law. Aryanization, which means the collapse of uh, Jewish economic opportunity, was imposed. And gradually this society, the society of Bach and Beethoven, the society of Goethe and Schiller, the society of Kant and Hegel became transformed into a murderous state. That's a history that we have to understand. It's a history by which, in a very real sense, that the Germans themselves are exploring in a very deep way, but for a very long time, German historians had the idea that anything that happened to the Jews or that the Jews did was of little interest. So all we needed to understand the phenomena of ghetto is to understand German policy on the outside of the ghetto that set up the ghetto, but what happened in the ghetto was of no importance. All we needed to understand the death camp was to understand that in essence trains were sent to the camp, selection was taking place, people were killed, the infrastructure was built, the destruction took place, and then you understood life in the camp. But what happened to the people inside, that was not of great importance. Jewish historians made the opposite case. They had somehow come to believe that the perpetrators were all of one type. No differences between them, no nuances between them, no understanding of the diversity and variety of killers and their circumstances, so that all that was important to telling the Shoah was telling the story from within what was happening to these people. And you had two people exploring the same event going like this passing like ships in the night and not talking with each other. And what Friedlander did in his meticulous way, year by year, month by month, region by region by region, chronicling, is to tell you not only what the killers were doing, but what the victims were experiencing. And adding to that what the outsiders were doing, America and Canada, Britain, the Vatican, and also the other players in this because there weren't only victims, bystanders, and perpetrators, there also were rescuers. There also were resistance fighters. There were a range of people, and what he does meticulously and extraordinarily was to juxtapose, as it were, all of the players in the story in order to understand what exactly had happened. So the methodology that we now understand is a methodology that in order to tell what really happened, you have to look at it from multiple angles at multiple times and understand in a very dramatic way that what happened in one place in 1941 happened very differently in a very different place in 1944. Very interesting story. The Holocaust evolved differently in different places. I was once reading a survivor's memoir, and the survivor wrote of his liberation in the Soviet Union on March 7th, 1944. Now the date's not going to be significant to you unless you're a Hungarian Jew. Because if you're a Hungarian Jew, you're going to say, he was liberated before the Holocaust began for me. He was a free man while I was still living in my home, in my family, in my community, in my town, going to school, opening my business, living virtually untouched. A little bit of anti-Semitism and like, but virtually untouched. It had ended for him before it began to me. So consequently, you have to understand the difference of the experience of Jews in the Soviet Union, in the occupied Soviet Union, than the difference of the Jews in Hungary. And when you look at a map that evolves in very different ways, 
You have to understand that chronology is a dynamic form. Let's now look for a moment at the killers. And virtually every week we discover something new about the killers. Let's talk visually first. I don't know if any of you saw the coverage that took place with the new album discovered. There was a great story in the New York Times about an album discovered called Monsters at Play. And what makes the album so extraordinary, it was all of the SS officers and enlisted men playing at Auschwitz. Young women sunning themselves. Young men doing what young men do at war when there are young men, women present. And I leave it to some of you, the imagination, because we're in a sanctuary. But young men at war, when there are young women present, are involved in dances and flirtation, in an attempt to conquer. The jokes they played, the dances they had, the swimming pools at Auschwitz, all of these people at leisure. Now to give it to you visually, you have to understand that these pictures were taken in the summer of 1944. Now again, if you're a Hungarian Jew, you understand that the whole Holocaust in Hungary occurred in 1944. On March 19th, the Germans invaded. In April and May, there was ghettoization, confiscation of property. And between the 15th of May and the 8th of July, 437,402 Jews were transported on 147 trains, primarily to Auschwitz, and 8 of 10 of them were killed within days of their arrival. And you have the magnificent photos of the Auschwitz album of the victims arriving, and you have the juxtaposition of the soldiers playing. And you have to understand that what they were doing by day was to send tens of thousands, 437,402 Jews on 147 trains in 54 days. 437,402 in 54 days means approximately 8,000 people a day are being sent to their death. And these guys in their off hours are playing. To understand the killers, we have to understand not only how they worked, but how they played. Not only what they did during the day, but what? But the, how they left off steam, let off steam at night. And if you think of them only as monsters instead of boys at play, you only get one half of the equation. And we have to put it all together. Now in one area of research, we have discovered something that has changed our understanding. One of the great scholars of this generation, Christopher Browning, wrote a book called The Origins of the Final Solution, in which he says that there was a lot of local decision-making and local initiative. And that is, instead of saying that a decision was made in Berlin and it was implemented immediately and all over the globe, what he shows, for example, is the ways in which different types of killing took place in different types of places at different moments in time and only, almost only afterwards did it congeal together into a coherent policy. That's not to say that there wasn't a decision made to impose the final solution on the Jewish problem and that Hitler did not make that decision, it was not implemented, and if you were going to give a simple description of the killing process, and I'm going to give it to you vividly and, rational, and, and rationally and structurally, 
The killing process essentially went in the following way. You discriminate against the Jews, make it impossible for them to live where they are. You hope to get rid of them, but there are two problems with that policy from 33 to 38. The first problem with that policy, from 33 to 39, the first problem with that policy is nobody wants to accept Jews in the numbers to which they need to leave. No haven, no way out. The one place in the world that wanted Jews was Palestine. The British by 1939 said 15,000 a year for five years. Not enough to take care of the load. And I'm in Canada, and Canada had a policy that's been documented called none are too many. And America's policy insisted on a certificate of good conduct to be issued by the Gestapo. And you had to have something called the LPC document, likely to become a public charge, which meant somebody who had $50,000 then, which is probably the equivalent of $5 million now, could be said he's likely to have the, uh, become a public charge if what, he never is able to work again. And Americans needed to provide affidavits in order to bring people in. So Jews wanted to get out, nowhere that they could go, and Germany kept expanding. It kept expanding, meaning that in one day, in 1938, it incorporated Austria and 200,000 Jews came under its control. In five years before, 150,000 Jews had left. When it went into the Czechoslovakia areas of Bohemia and Moravia, another 90,000 Jews came under its control. When it invaded Poland, 2 million Jews came under its control by January 20th, 1942. The moment of Wannsee, the Germans believed that they had within their reach 11 million Jews. Can't get rid of these people, what? You can't get rid of them by immigration, nobody wants them, and we keep getting more and more of them, another way has to be found. And the killing gradually went in two directions. First, they sent mobile killers to victims. The Einsatz group in 1941, then they reversed it. They found something remarkable. It was difficult for them, for killers to kill all day. And little things happened. People needed alcohol afterwards, but then they needed alcohol at the beginning and they needed alcohol in the middle. Discipline broke down. Also, there were some mental breakdowns, so the process was changed. And instead of sending mobile killers to stationary victims, they reversed it and they made the victims mobile and the killing centers stationary, meaning that they put the Jews and brought them on trains and sent them to killing centers, where essentially a staff of very few could kill very many. I worked on Belgitz. Belgitz was open for 10 months. The staff of Belgitz was 104, of whom only 14 were Germans, and they killed within 10 months 500,000 Jews. Why? Because they developed an infrastructure, an assembly line of process. What Christopher Browning shows is that there was innovation in little things. You know how gassing began? Gassing began first for mentally retarded, physically infirm, and emotionally distraught and handicapped Germans, where first they starved these people, then they gave them lethal injections, but doctors didn't like lethal injections because it's not right. And then what they did is they developed mobile gas vans, and finally they developed stationary killing centers. If that sounds familiar, the identical process repeated itself with regard to the killing of Jews, except there was no injection. First killing was by starvation in the Warsaw Ghetto. 10% of the Jews died in 1941 before a bullet was shot. You had mobile killing units, and I don't know if you've been reading 
the incredible research that's going on today, and it's worth digressing for a moment, there's a Roman Catholic Church in France who is doing something gruesome but extraordinary. He's going from village to village to village to village in Eastern Europe in the former occupied areas of the Soviet Union with his collar and he's meeting the townspeople who are, were born and alive in 1941, which means that is 66 years ago. And he's meeting people in their late 70s, early 80s, and 90s. And he's interviewing them, and then he is marking the killing fields. And we've gotten him rabbinic supervision and gotten him rabbinic permission to dig up some of these killing fields to get the physical evidence. It's gruesome. But he's now able to do something that is remarkable. It tells us about the perpetrator in the most physically undeniable way imaginable. You see, with the perpetrator, he's able to find what bullets were used, what rifles were used. And therefore, he's able to tell you by meeting with forensic experts who did the killing. Was it the Wehrmacht? Was it the SS? Was it the local gendarmerie? Was it the local police force? Was it local anti-Semites who were villagers who killed them with a, the type of rifles that one kept on their farm? And if Jan Gross was be able to tell you that in the village of Yedvavne, it was neighbors who used the occasion of the Germans being in the vicinity to kill their neighbors, and then covered it up and denied that it happened and blamed it on the Germans. We are now able to go through village after village, hamlet after hamlet, city after city, area after area, and tell you indisputably who did what. And therefore we understand that this crime which one could have imagined was even more limited the nature of the perpetrator widens, the nature of the perpetrator grows. And we have to ask an awful lot, not only about the perpetrator, but why the locals were cooperating in the ways in which they were cooperating. And then sadly, and I say this, and you'll forgive me, but when you speak about the killers, you have to be direct. Everybody who describes the killing fields uses one thing that is unsettling. We often, we often thought it was poetic. They said the ground continued to move for days after the killing had taken place. Several autopsies were done. There was a policy, remember that victims were killed bullet by bullet, person by person, one by one by one. There was a policy that was instituted there that said you can only spend one bullet on one Jew. And therefore, if the bullet didn't work the first time, people were buried alive. And the only victims whose testimonies we have from the killing fields were victims who crawled out where the bullet didn't kill them or the bullet actually missed them and they crawled out at night after the killing was over. But we, we've discovered now by autopsies is that literally thousands were not dead but buried alive. And what we thought was poetry of the ground moving now has to be seen as desperate efforts of the living to 
climb out, many of which were thoroughly unsuccessful. So we now understand who the killers were differently than we thought that the killers were, and you can't begin, for example, to do as our President Reagan had done to say there was the Waffen SS who were good guys, but the SS who were bad guys. And you can't differentiate, as Germany did up until a generation ago, between the army, which was noble, and the, and the SS, which was ignoble. But you have to say that the killers were also a whole range of locals who were killing their neighbors for a variety of reasons, and they were both killing and then inheriting against the prophet's prophetic injunction, Haaragta Vagam Yarashta. Have you killed and also inherited? And more than that, that the people who were buried were often buried alive. Christopher Browning then discovers that the innovation in gassing for the mobile killing units was done by local mechanics, kids who worked in the motor pool. They came up with the idea of how do you do, they were so told we want to kill Jews, how do you develop a gas van? They gave it to a bunch of 18 year old or 20 year old kids who were mechanics and they developed the gas van. They took the exhaust pipe, they had a rubber hose, they made a hole in the floor in the back of the equivalent of a truck and they piped the gas in. And then they had a terrible problem and this is all documented physically. They had a terrible problem, which is the rear axles broke because everybody pushed toward the back of the truck and the rear axles broke, so they discovered how to pride in their work, they discovered how to strengthen the rear axles. And then they discovered how to strengthen the rear door, and when they wrote back to Renault and said, you're not designing your rear axles, axles with enough strength. The mechanics at Renault said, we design it with enough strength for every load imaginable. And they said, but not for some of the needs that we have. Kids, mechanics, the type of guys that you and I see every day working on our cars as we bring our cars in, not even the guys who work at the dealers, but the guys who work in body shops who jerry-rig stuff. And here they jerry-rig death, again, local initiative, which presented a different story. We see this again and again and again as the research evolves. We also see that the killing evolved differently in different places. I told you about Belgium. It's open for 10 months, 500,000 Jews killed. But I didn't, and by the way, the killing was so total that of the 500,000 Jews killed, there are only two known survivors. One was killed on the day he gave testimony, and his wife, who had lived with him for a year, said, I know that my testimony can't count in court, but please let me tell his story because that's all he's been able to talk about and only because they transcribed what she had said do we know what he had said. And the other was the only survivor. Belgitz was dismantled for two months during its ten months because they discovered the gas chambers were inadequate. Took too long, too much trouble, and consequently they refined the process. And once they refined the process, the same refinements were used at Treblinka and Sobibor, and it was expanded throughout. And Belzhitz was closed after 10 months because there were no more Jews in the vicinity to kill. And in fact, its job had been done. It is the place where the Jews of Galicia, the Glitzianas, were all killed. And we have village by village, town by town, day by day, week by week. One word about documentation, then I want to switch to the victims for a moment. Some of you may have read that in the last three months we have, the last month we have had the treaty signed by 11 nations. 
which allowed what is called the International Tracing Service documents to be exported from Germany, where they were under the control of the International Red Cross and brought to 11 major centers, one in each of the 11 countries in the United States. It will be at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. In Israel, it will be at Yad Vashem. And these are 100 million documents. It is virtually every scrap of paper that was deposited by the military government in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust which documents the crime and the material is not yet searchable by modern technology. Meaning that for those of you who know it, it is an image, it is not a searchable document. And part of what we're going to have to discover is how to transform these records from an image into a searchable document so that you can do the juxtaposition. But we experimented with one record, just to show you its scope. Hungarian Jew who arrived, and he didn't know it, but he was on the list of people to be deported from Auschwitz to Dora. And then we discover why he was not, and there was a very peculiar thing when you see him on the list of people to be deported to Dora, there is a line crossing out his name. Why would there be a line crossing out his name? If you look down the document, you discover something very interesting, that all of the people on this transport were aged 9, 10, 11, and 12. You scratch yourself and say, why were they taking children to Dora? And then you discover that they were building rockets in Dora and they needed little hands which had not yet grown. And they had a description in the document of the size of these people. And all of you who have had teenage children understand that there's a moment in teenagehood when the kid stops being a child and all of a sudden looks overgrown and what is one of the first things that grows? The hands and the feet. Right? All of your mothers know how many times did you buy shoes three and four times a year with a little child. All of these kids were being shipped because they were going to work on small rocket parts and they were going to be kept alive because they needed these small hands. This one child is crossed off the list. Do you know why? Because he was in the infirmary that day. And he was in the infirmary that day with a diagnosis of potential typhus, which meant they didn't want to expose him to any German. The Jews could get typhus, but typhus doesn't stop merely by race or by religion, so they didn't let him go out at that point, and they kept him in quarantine because even to kill him, he'd have to be exposed to a German. And consequently, they kept him off the list, and we then follow why he was not in Dora, how long he was in the infirmary, when they were doing it, and how they were measuring his hands in order to see if he was to be deported. And then you look at where he went from there and where he went from there and where he went from there. And every scrap of paper fits in every piece of documentation. Now in order to understand the fate of all of the individuals and who their killers were, because this documentation is not only the victims, it's the story of every single soldier of every single SS man, of all of the people who are involved. You need to get this into a searchable thing, and then you need to isolate it person by person, story by story, narrative by narrative. And it will be another generation before we're able to fill it in, but for many survivors this will present the only opportunity and the last opportunity in your lifetime to find whatever material record there exists of your past and of your parents and your children, your siblings and your spouses who are left behind. This also, material also contains about 36 million records of life in the BP camp. And someday we are going to be able to discover the great mystery of Jewish life. 
by searching this. The greatest single mystery of contemporary Jewish life is the mystery embodied in the survivor's decision in the aftermath of death to rebuild life. Didn't have to happen that way. They could have decided not to rebuild life. They could have decided not to rebuild life as Jews. They could have decided not to bring children into the world. But the extraordinary juxtaposition of what education they received, where they sought to go, why they sought to go there, how they searched to find somebody who was missing, all of this material exists in scraps of records that now have to be brought together. Let me talk on two minutes or three minutes a little bit about the victim and then a little bit about the bystander and then take it with questions because otherwise we'll go way too long. We've come to a richer understanding of the life of the victim. The richer understanding of life of the victim means that expressed very beautifully by a man by the name of David Marwell, who said, just because Jews were powerless does not mean that they were passive. That Jews did many different types of things as a means of coping with their fate. The great literary historian by the name of Lawrence Langer said, the victim ultimately faced choiceless choices between the impossible and the untenable, and we can't think of choosing good or choosing bad. We have to think of making choices between the impossible and the unacceptable. But we also have to understand that Jews did hundreds of things of initiative in order to resist, in order to survive, in order to endure. When I teach resistance, I teach that their resistance and armed resistance was not a matter of physical courage. I tell the story which many of you know better than I, which is the story of Janusz Korczak. Korczak was a great Polish Jewish educator who was the equivalent in the United States of what we would say Dr. Spock and Mr. Rogers. And he had created a whole series of fairy tales for children. When the Warsaw Ghetto was about to be destroyed, he was offered a way of saving himself, and he said, and what about the children? And he was told, no, we can't save the children. He said, therefore, I stay with my children. And what he did was he marched his children to the train to Treblinka in the most extraordinary way imaginable by having a parade and a demonstration, and they're singing, and everybody who watched this was silent. Now, it took courage, enormous physical courage for Korchak to say, I only save the, all of the children or I go with my children. It's the same type of courage that teachers face when they stay with their children in classes when there are fires or earthquakes or when there are floods and when there are hurricanes, but it's the ordinary courage that we face. So courage was not an issue. Who were the resistance fighters? The resistance fighters had three elements involved. Number one, they were young. They neither had young children nor old parents. Consequently, they could be responsible only for themselves. Meaning that if a mother stays with her two-year-old child, that's natural. How could she not stay with her child if a man stays with his elderly mother? Of course. But some people reach a stage in life where they can think solely about themselves and they're responsible almost only to themselves. Secondly, they knew they were going to die. Prior to that, if you didn't know you were going to die, you would say, if I escape, then 10 or 100 or 1,000 could be killed in my wake. I can't endanger everybody, therefore I can't escape. Or if the ghetto erupts in a armed uprising, it means everybody's going to die. And therefore, the only time you could take that responsibility was what? When you knew that you were going to die. 
and therefore resistance was not a way to live but a decision to make what statement do you make with the fact that you're going to die you want a contemporary equivalent that's the difference between united 93 when they said let's roll the people on united 93 knew that they were going to die on that plane therefore they could attack the hijackers because they had nothing possibly to lose so resistance was not the final romantic stand, it was the last stand. Only those who knew they were going to die were going to do it, and that leads me to another issue, and with this I'm just going to touch on it in close. Rescue. I did a book on the bombing of Auschwitz. If you read the documentation on the bombing of Auschwitz, you would say that it's, in one sense, ridiculous. The decision of the request to bomb Auschwitz was a request that was made in 1944 and only in 1944. It was made at one moment in time. It was made when the United States could have the bases in Italy could fly to Auschwitz and back from Auschwitz on one tank of airplane gas. 512 miles there, 512 miles back. The reason for that was America did not send its people on suicidal missions. There should have been at least a theoretical possibility of coming back. There's the famous correspondence of John J. McLoy in which he says such an action even if uh, he says uh, such an action would require the diversion of um, uh, forces now essential and would be of such dubious efficacy that it would not warrant the use of such resources. You read that, John J. McLoy was the Assistant Secretary of War in those days, and you read documents, Senators, so you would figure out what that means. We'd have to be committed to doing it, and we're not sure that it worked. He then says something else. He says, such an action might provoke a more vindictive response on the part of the Germans. You scratch your head at that point, and you go crazy. When you read that, you have to scream, what the hell is more vindictive than Auschwitz? What, are they going to come back and say, next time, no more nice guys? And you scratch your head and you say, only a man who didn't know what Auschwitz was could make a decision like that, saying it might provoke a more vindictive response than Auschwitz, a more vindictive response on the part of the Germans. Now let me, and most of us would say clearly what was involved was anti-Semitism. And clearly what was involved is they didn't care enough. But I'm an empirical historian, meaning that I have my own ideological convictions, but I have to face evidence wherever it takes me. We came across a very interesting, fascinating, and deeply and profoundly problematic document. And I want to take you through that for a couple of seconds. The document is a meeting of the Jewish Agency in 1944 on June 11th, in which the Jewish Agency, being chaired by David Ben-Gurion, decides not to request that Auschwitz be bombed. Now, let's grant a couple of working hypotheses and let's presume that you'll come along with me, though perhaps there are one or two would not. Let's presume for a moment that David Ben-Gurion was not an anti-Semite. You only grant me that as a working hypothesis? Well, if David Ben-Gurion was not an anti-Semite and the people sitting around the table were not anti-Semites, why is it that David Ben-Gurion could say, we can't request that Auschwitz be bombed? Then let's add complications to this. On July 7, 1944, Moshe Shertak, who later became Moshe Sharet, the first foreign minister of Israel, 
and the second Prime Minister of Israel, and Chaim Weizmann, both working in London, request that Auschwitz be bombed. Now, June 11th, there's a decision made not to bomb Auschwitz. July 7th, there is a decision by Schertak and um, Weizmann to bomb Auschwitz. There are three possible explanations. Let me go with two for a moment. One is that Schertak and Weizmann were operating contrary to assumption, to policy. For Chaim Weizmann, that was possible. For Moshe Shertak, that would have been the only time in his history that he had operated contrary to instructions. So you look then, is there a change of policy? Is there a change of policy in, Israel, in Palestine in those days regarding the decision of June 11th? You find no such documentation. So either they're operating contrary to assumptions or the decision of June 11th, 1944 became non-operative. Right? One of two possibilities. It became non-operative, it was countermanded by something, or they were operating contrary to assumptions. You then scratch your head and you say, what could have made the decision non-operative? And the answer comes in one document, which was an April 7th report by two escapees, a report of two escapees who escaped on April 7th, 1944 from Auschwitz. It was called the Auschwitz Protocols. And it was the Verba Wexler report. Verba was a man who recently died in, in uh, Calgary. And he was an escapee from Auschwitz who brought a detailed map of Auschwitz, including a report of the killing centers and including a report that they were building the famous tracks into Birkenau in behalf of the oncoming killing of Hungarian Jews. We know that he prepared, prepared that material in Slovakia, that it reached Hungary, and that an executive summary reached Washington in June, but the full text did not reach Washington until November. And we can now assume that the full text reached Jerusalem sometime in June. And once it reached Jerusalem, Jerusalem now had knowledge and therefore could request that bombing actually take place because they understood that if they were reluctant before to request the bombing of Auschwitz because innocent civilians would be killed, they now understood that to destroy the infrastructure of Auschwitz was what? Was essential because they couldn't kill the numbers they were killing without the infrastructure for destruction. So Weizmann and Schertak were in all probability operating with instructions because Ben-Gurion and his cohorts realized that it didn't require a meeting anymore. And once you knew what Auschwitz was, then you got to do something about Auschwitz. Now, let me make the largest of all points. When we discussed the bystander, we had an easy solution before. If only they had known they would have done something. And what's the frightening lesson we have from our world? The frightening lesson we have from our world is we know that genocide is taking place. In Rwanda, the French and the British, uh, the French and the Belgians withdrew their armies. The UN confined its military presence to base. The American Marines went in to save American citizens. And only the volunteers stayed to combat the genocide in Rwanda. Only the volunteers stayed to combat the genocide in Rwanda, meaning that knowledge is not sufficient. You need political will to combat genocide. And in Darfur today, we see what's happening. And we in America know very well what type of political will it takes to commit troops. 
And so far, everybody has a wonderful excuse for not doing something about Darfur. And the killing continues to kill. So if in World War II during the Shoah it took knowledge to act, knowledge to get with resistance, knowledge to request the boldest actions of rescue, we now live in a global universe and know an awful lot that we about places that are far off. Genocide is not hidden and the world has demonstrated no political will to combat genocide. And the only people who are, dis who are demonstrating a political will to act in the face of genocide are those who remember the past and scream on behalf of the victims. Sometimes we scream at the world to change the world. Sometimes we scream at the world to make sure the world does not change us. But living in our time, at this moment, for both of those reasons, we must scream at the world. Last point, I wish that I were dealing with a subject that was irrelevant. I wish that we could come how someday a successor to me and a successor to you will be able to report that the Holocaust was such an overwhelming manifestation of evil that the people who remembered it and transmitted its memory to future generations did a service to humanity which pleaded for human decency, which enhanced the domain of human responsibility, which shouted on behalf of human dignity that the world learned something from the event. Right now I teach what I teach not because I believe that the world learned something from the event, but because I can't live in a world which forgets an event like this and which ignores an event like this and doesn't take this as the energy to plead for better humanity. Let's take questions. Thank you very much. See, juxtapose the wall behind you. And I was chilled by the question that you put to us. The question that you said is so inexplicable how did people who went through the Shoah, how did they make a decision once again for life? More and more people are coming to me and telling me a similar story. They have discovered, maybe at the death of a parent, this is frequently the case, they have discovered that, in fact, their ancestors are Jewish. Their parents had been Christian, and they had been raised Christian. Their parents were Holocaust survivors and had decided not to become Jewish, any, not to be Jewish anymore. To me, it's, I always respond and I say how understandable What's really difficult to understand is how anyone went through what they did and still decided to remain Jewish and to raise children as Jews. But these people want to reclaim something. And they come in from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds to discover something about their Jewishness and many of them today are becoming Jewish. You ask the question, what do we know and what are we likely to know and what don't we know? As Jews, we know about creation at the bottom of our frieze over here. And then we know about Revelation, the giving of Torah, at the top of our frieze over here. 
This is the wall that we know. And here is the wall that we don't know. The barbed wire and the manacles and the worms, at least what I see as worms. And maybe this is the only shul in the world that has a wall full of worms. And those worms turn into birds and they fly high. And there are tools, a shofar to scream and shout with, a book to learn from, a menorah for some vision and some ideals. I want to thank you for opening up these great questions of life and for, for presenting it in such a cogent and defined manner in front of us today so that we see the Holocaust not only in terms of events but in terms of experience and in terms of the challenge that we face as people who have been through Auschwitz and therefore are still in Auschwitz, people who are still asking questions, people are still looking to learn what we don't know. Thank you very much. I had a very simple problem which is, uh, I have written 16 books on this issue, I've given courses and seminars and the like. I was asked to condense research to 45 minutes. Therefore, part of what I know from museum work is a museum is not an encyclopedia, and therefore not everything could be said. I.G. Farben had plenty of guilt. I can only say this, that if you want to look at the corporate guilt of German corporations, you have to say the following. That 700 million, and I'll give you one statistic. 700 million Reichsmarks, which was 400 million, uh, 1942 dollars, which we'd have to guess is what, 8 billion today, 10 billion today, 12 billion today. It's got to be at least uh, 30 fold since then. Was invested in Auschwitz in 1942. Now, some of you industrialists who know this better than I, nobody invests that type of money in without making that a capital investment with the assumption that it's going to yield fruit for a long period of time. The reason they built those industries at Auschwitz and later at other camps and at the same time at other camps is because they expected slave labor to be available for free or virtually free for the foreseeable future and they wanted to exploit it. And the degree of their exploitation is monumental. One other figure which is very interesting and again a little issue that disturbs historians for a very long period of time which we only discovered in the Soviet archives. There was a period of time for of several weeks in which Zyklon B was not being used at Auschwitz and the gas chambers went uh, dark. We asked ourselves, is that a change in policy? And the answer was no. The answer was that during wartime, the company that supplied the Zyklon B, which was a offshoot of IG Farben, had run out of the chemical that gave an odor to Zyklon B and therefore gave it the patent. And they were not going to provide Zyklon B for killing if they couldn't protect their patents. The advice for them was given by a lawyer, with all due respect to my distinguished colleague who is a jurist. It was given to them by a lawyer in order to what? In order to save their patent. No great moral issue, no great political issue, but a not insignificant economic. It's a very good question. The normal course of politics is that a friend of your friend is a friend, and an enemy of your enemy is an, is an ally. Right? Namely, that if you have a common enemy, you should be allied for a certain achievement of goal. 
Ukrainian Jews, there's a long history as to why they were not allied, and a long history including the question of the roles that Jews had to play, the roles vis-a-vis -vis peasants, the roles vis-a-vis -vis society. We don't have the time to go into that. The most intriguing thing during the Holocaust was that the commonality of a German enemy did not unite the forces, not in Poland, not in Ukraine, not elsewhere. In other countries, it did. Denmark always said, why, do, why did we rescue our Jews? They were, we didn't rescue Jews, we came to the aid of our fellow citizens. Denmark said, we don't have a Jewish problem, we have a, uh, an issue of fellow citizens. So we don't do that. The answer in the Ukraine was that the divisions were so great that they could not even be overcome by a common enemy. And to go into that at great length, I don't want to do it this hour. But uh, it's an interesting question. There's been much more research on why in Poland than the Ukraine. But in the aftermath of what's been happening in the Ukraine with this amount of research, that is a question that's going to be asked again and again and again. Because in the Ukraine, it was a lot of locals who acted, used the occasion of the Germans in the vicinity to kill their Jews. Let me go into three parts of what you said very briefly. The first is that he is right and he is wrong. He's right, namely, that the Holocaust as one form of ethnic cleansing must be seen within the context of all other forms of ethnic cleansing. Just like I have no problem understanding the Holocaust within the history of genocide. But whenever you understand it with that, you understand what is unique about it or unprecedented in sin. You learn what it shares in common with other instances of ethnic cleansing. With regard to the Jews and the Germans, it was in Germany that the Jews were portrayed not only getting rid of the Jews, but ridding the earth of the Jews was essential to the national salvation of the German people. And the, German, the Germans portrayed the Jews during the Nazi era not only as uh, a problem, but as a cancer who threatened the very body and bodily health. And their goal was to restructure the very genetic makeup of humanity itself. That did not occur with other forms of ethnic cleansing where you cleanse them from an area and that was sufficient, number one. Number two, the major element of knowledge, historians distinguish between information and knowledge. Um, let me give you a, a very simple uh, non-pernicious distinction between information and knowledge. All of you know very smart women who had a lump in their breast and did not go to see a doctor. All of you know smart men and women who had shooting pains up and down their arms or in their chest and thought it was indigestion and didn't go to emergency work. Meaning they had lots of information, but for reasons that seem in retrospect peculiar, they didn't let the information reach the level of knowledge which generated action. For many people, they had passive knowledge that the Jews would not return. One of the things that Saul Friedland does remarkably in his book is to go through the diaries, the newspaper articles, and a whole range of things that were being done at this time and shows the degree to which people did quotation marks know. Now, let me give you a simple example about knowledge. Many Jews who returned home after the war found somebody sleeping in their beds, living in their homes, being at their table, occupying their home, occupying their factories, and their place of business. If I go to your home as your guest, and I expect you to return. I may be comfortable during the time that I'm there, but I'm really not going to throw out that hideous picture over your dining room table. And I'm not really going to cast out your family pictures. I'm not really going to alter the makeup of the home, and I'm going to move in my suitcase, but I'm not going to move in my luggage and all my furniture and all my possessions. On a very deep level, lots of people understood the Jews were never coming back. Many survivors recall that little kids would go by trains and stand watching trains and they'd go like this. 
Now that doesn't mean that they understood the full magnitude of the Gassic program, but it does mean that they understood that the Jews were getting what? Killed. And people felt comfortable enough to presume that. Germany felt comfortable enough to impose a law which said that once Jews leave the territory, their possessions belong to the state. And that was the rule in all the occupied territories because they did it legality. So to say you didn't know meant that you had a lot of information which you didn't allow to reach the level of knowledge. In post-911 world, it's what we call connecting the dots. Lots of information is out there, but the dots are not connected. And part of the reasons the dots were not connected was because you didn't want to know it. And by the way, even for some of the victims, let me tell you a very specific story. When did the resistance in Warsaw know what was happening in Treblinka? Resistance in Warsaw sent a man by the name of Zygmunt Freilich. Zygmunt Freilich was a man who had good contacts from his union days with the railroad workers. He went on a train going to Treblinka, which stopped up off at the last stop, and he asked the people what's happening. They reported as follows. Trains are arriving every day. They arrive full, they go back empty. There is no noise from the camp at night. No wells have been dug, no food has been delivered, no supplies have been delivered to the camp. So far it doesn't say what? Anything about death, but what? You gotta ask the question, how is it that hundreds of thousands of people are arriving, no food, no wells, etc. We know the answer. He then meets an escapee from Treblinka, one of the very few. He asks him, how am I going to tell the resistance what's happening? And he says, I've got to find a way into Treblinka and out of Treblinka to tell the story. And the man says to him, take a deep breath. And the smell of burning flesh is a unique smell. The difference between the resistance groups in Warsaw is that they sent somebody to literally face up to what was happening. Key moment in American history, 1943, on the eve of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's meeting with Jan Mikarski, who was my colleague, my friend. I talked with him for 20 years at Georgetown. Felix Frankfurter is meeting with him. Felix Frankfurter was an American Supreme Court Justice, close friend of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's meeting with him up an afternoon. There are three people, the three top Jews in the Roosevelt administration, all of whom are listening to a Polish courier who has just come, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto, and who was in his Bika, though he thought he had been in Belgians. He tells his story. And the other two men leave shaken profoundly, and Felix Frankfurter stays. He's sitting in the living room of the Polish ambassador, and he says to Jan Karski, young man, I can't believe you. Polish ambassador springs up he says, Felix, on this man's word, we stake the lives of men. I swear on my life, on the life of my children, on the credibility of my government, that this man is telling you the truth, the whole truth. And I stake my total reputation on this, swear on the lives of my children. Frankfurter turned to the ambassador who was, whose name was Chekhanov. And he said, you don't understand me. It's not that I don't believe he's telling the truth. It's that I can't believe him. There is a difference. The evidence 
Francis Ben Gurion turned down the bombing of Auschwitz on June 11th, 1944, and that by July 7th, 1944, the Jewish Agency was requesting that Auschwitz be bombed. I assume that Ben Gurion was not an anti-Semite, therefore he had legitimate concerns, right or wrong, for turning down the request to bomb Auschwitz in June 1944. I presume, though I have no documentation, that when Shurtak and Weizmann asked that Auschwitz be bombed in July 1944, they did so with Ben-Gurion's knowledge. My hypothesis, how do you make sense of both things, is that a document arrived in Jerusalem between June 11, 1944 and July 7, 1944, that made Ben-Gurion's decision of June 11, 1944 ridiculous and non-operative. What could that document be? Clearly that document could be something that describes to everyone what the full scope of Auschwitz was like. There is a difference between Jewish resistance and non-Jewish resistance. In non-Jewish resistance, the resistance fighters could expect to blend into the population, could expect support from the general population. Jewish resistance fighters were isolated. They did not have generalized support. They could not easily blend in. Men could bless to blend in less easily than women. The only people who could blend in nicely were those who had complete linguistic command of the native language and those who didn't look, look typically, stereotypically Jewish. If you looked blonde-haired, blue-eyed like a shiksa goddess, you could get away with it. If you looked dark-haired, dark-eyed like a, a tribal ethnic Jew, you could not. Therefore, the stakes in joining resistance for Jews and non-Jews were different, and therefore non-Jews could join resistance as an opposition to uh, Nazi Germany earlier and without the same type of collective reprisal that could be expected of Jews. Academics were prevalent throughout um, uh, the Nazi party. Academics were attracted to this. One of the things philosophers have to deal with is that the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, used his prestige as a great philosopher to do this. You can go in virtually every field to show that. It's one of the elements that we have to confront in doing it. Sir, you are technically correct, namely that the Hungarians were not exactly terrific before they consented to the murder of the Jews. When I say that the Holocaust actually took place in Hungary between March 19th, 1944 and June 8, July 8th, 1944, I'm talking about the great action of ghettoization, deportation, segregation, and murder. And one can always say that in making a larger story, one should point out the smaller details. The last point uh, I wanted to, uh, the indifference with regard to the Holocaust. Look, we are living in a world in which the most essential question of all, and this is where Canada is an extraordinary model, and I say this as one who is not native to this country, the largest question in the world is whether we are going to fall back into tribal, into tribal elements that define the other as demonic, or whether we're going to be able to find a common ground that, def that defines the other as fellow, fellow X, fellow Y, fellow Z. In religious terms, do we have to regard those of another faith as false and demonic, evil, horrific, foolish and stupid, and, and, and to use Ann Coulter's term, you know, imperfect, terrible, all of that stuff, or are we going to be able to find ourselves as common what? common creatures of, a collect of the one God. In Islam you have the very simple, in, in Judaism you have the idea of Adam Nivra B'Tselem, man was created in the image. In Christianity you have the element of, look, when I did Archbishop Ram Kali, who later became John the 23rd, I showed he had no special love for the Jews, he just believed that all men were created in the image of God and, without excluding the Jews. That was sufficient to make him an anti-Nazi. Islam has a way of recognizing, and remember for many generations, 
it was far preferable to be a Jew living in Islamic lands than it was in a Jew living under Christian domination. The record of Islam vis-a-vis -vis historically vis-a-vis -vis Jews is far better than the record of Christianity vis-a-vis -vis Jews, except that in the last 60 years there's been a conscious effort within Christianity to undo the elements that were could possibly lead to anti-Semitism. What is Canada the example of? Canada is the example of where people of different backgrounds, ethnics, races, creeds, origins and the like can find a commonality. That's essential to our world. Let me say a word about the Palestinians. Look, Jews wished we had an easy narrative. We wish the narrative that we had was that a people without a land came to a land without a people upon which to be reborn. We also wish deeply and profoundly that we could essentially divide and therefore divorce from the Palestinians and the Jews could live alongside each other but not necessarily one with each other because there's no evidence that either side wants them to live with each other. We have not achieved that. There have been attempts to achieve that. There are wrongs on each side and anger on each side. And the real issue collectively for us that is going to be faced in Annapolis and faced by the next administration in the United States, in Israel, and in the Palestinian areas is whether indeed we can ultimately find a way of secularizing the issue and essentially finding a means of separating the two people. Otherwise, we cannot, there is no evidence that these two people can live together successfully. Therefore, they have to live apart, and they have to live apart, hopefully, with justice and with dignity for both sides. Thank you very much.